you guys were not. I, I, oh, you were. You were in. Uh, actually, you were in our preseason. I was in Portland as well. <laughs> I want to cover playoff hockey in Vancouver. I want the fans to enjoy and experience playoff hockey in Vancouver. I want the Canucks to win a Stanley Cup for this city. And looking at Raptors Twitter right now, a fade for Cade. I feel like a lot of them are, are, are you know, would, would love to see, would love to see him there. I mean, I'm not advocating for that, but I mean, I know that's that's big on Raptors Twitter minds these days. LA gave one out to to uh, to Jared Goff, and they've already moved on. Right. They didn't think that that could work. So okay, sports fans, it's time for the Unnamed Sports Show. Here's your host, Joshua Griffith. Hello and welcome to the Unnamed Sports Show here on the Sports Talk Line Network where we talk sports 24-7, 365. As you heard in the introduction from the wonderful Don Andrews, I am your host, Joshua Griffith, here for episode 56. Today on the show, I'm going to be talking with Blake Murphy, writer for The Athletic and uh, host of the Columbia House Party podcast. We're going to be talking all things Canada basketball. We're going to talk about the NBA Conference Finals, the Suns punching their ticket to the NBA Finals, uh, punching Chris Paul in the back as he walks away, and a little bit more. So I hope that everyone can tune in and really enjoy this episode. Before we get to the interview with Blake, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe to the Sports Talk Line Network, follow me on Twitter at Joshua Griffith Zero. That's the number zero. And um, comment along. Let me know what you guys think of the Canada Basketball's tournament in Victoria and the NBA and what's going on there. And then, of course, I couldn't have Blake Murphy on without chatting a little bit of Raptors. So we're going to debunk some of those Pascal Siakam trade rumor myths, and uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more Raptors. So without further ado, I hope that you enjoy my conversation with Blake Murphy. All right, so I'm joined now on the Unnamed Sports Show by writer for The Athletic and co-host of Columbia House Party Podcast. Kind enough to join me on this July 1st Canada Day. Blake Murphy. Blake, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me on, Joshua. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Excited to chat some hoops. First off, I uh, check in with my guests. How are you doing? Uh, pandemic starting to get over here. I know we're finally not in a state of emergency for the first day, and I think 460 days over in British Columbia. So, how are you doing? Your family staying safe and healthy? Yeah, uh, for the most part. I'm I'm a new uncle, which has been fun. Oh, congrats. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of family out in Newfoundland that I haven't been able to get out and see now in, in like since like summer 2019. Yeah. So. Uh, that's been a challenge a little bit, but I've been healthy and employed. And for those things, uh, you know, you got to be pretty, pretty thankful. Um, and there's a, sorry, getting I'm dog sitting, which is why there's like <laughs> pillows and stuff stacked up in a cardboard box blocking some stuff. And uh, Luna would like to say hello and play apparently. So I, sorry about that. No worries. I am really surprised actually in the 56 episodes that I've done that my cat has not made any appearances in, <laughs> in the, in the show at all by either jumping on my lap. She, she decides to wait till I'm uh, not recording, thankfully. So <laughs> I, I completely understand all of that. This is uh this is Luna's first podcast while I'm dog sitting her. So well, she's, Luna, uh, she's trying Lu to get some shine. Luna, welcome to the Unnamed Sports Show. We are a very pet-friendly show here. Um, <laughs> Sorry actually, that. just wrote a uh, an article about the the super fan dog from the Las Vegas Golden Knights, Bark Andre Freery, and about all the good work he does for uh, Children's Hospital and stuff. So perfect, um, perfect. Every team should have a dog. It's uh, yeah. I, there I was a baseball team a couple years ago that had one, and I can't remember. I can't remember the details, but. So there's about four or five now. There's uh, the Washington Capitals have one. There's a couple of other teams. I know that something that Bart wanted to do is, is have every team have a, a dog that is also a therapy dog for, for cancer awesome. patients. So um, we're, we're slowly working on getting that throughout the NHL. I mean, I'm trying to help him with that as much as I can, just despite my limited resources uh, and, and pull, but uh I know that's something that they want to happen, have happen in the next uh, in the next couple of years. So yeah, that's great. That's a great idea. But Blake, I didn't bring you on to talk about pets or 
basketball, despite we or sorry, uh, pets or hockey, despite probably being able to do that for the whole podcast. But uh, I want to talk some hoops with you. So we have the Canada men's national team down in Victoria for the Olympic qualifying tournament. They were able to uh, get past China 2-0 and in Group A with a 109-97 win. What did you make of the game last night? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, that one's that one's a pretty straightforward one for Canada. The uh, the real challenge in, in the prelim stage was going to be that Greece game, their, their yeah. opener. Um, and Canada is a better team on paper than, than Greece is. But Canada was coming in with no exhibition games, uh, no tune-up games. They played against their own U19 team that's competing in Latvia this coming week in the, the U19 World Cup. And that was it. Um, so, you know, once you get past that Greek team, uh, that's a little more experience and has a little more continuity. That, that's kind of the big hurdle at the group stage. Now, what I will say from the China game, though, is across the Greek, the Greece game and the China game, uh, I think it's encouraging that Canada has seen a lot of different looks offensively and defensively from their opponents. So Greece wants to slow it down a little bit and get it inside. China, meanwhile, wants to, is the only team in this tournament in Victoria that wants to run more than Canada does. Yes. Uh, and then defensively, you know, they've, they've had to handle some Greek switching. They've had to handle some Chinese zones. Uh, so they, they've, for a team that hasn't been together very long and hasn't had a lot of reps together, they've seen a lot through two games. And I think that should be helpful. Um, Turkey's going to, you know, Turkey's the big team to worry about, and, and they skew a little more toward Greece than, than they do toward China stylistically. Um, but yeah, plenty of, plenty of challenges to come, but so far so good. And it looks like Canada won't see Greece or see Turkey until the, the finals possibly. And it looks like they're going to be facing the winner of Czech Republic and Uruguay. Um, which team would Canada want? Or do you, you don't think it'll matter at this point? I think it has to be up to Canada to do it. Yeah. I mean, that that's the attitude you have to have, right? It is whoever, Whoever you're getting lost to Turkey, and you're gonna you're gonna have to beat Turkey if you want if you want to win. So um, you know if you're if you're hoping for the easiest possible outcome, you know Uruguay is not as talented and on paper don't look as good as the Czechs. So um, you could lean that way. I, I'm personally expecting a, a pretty straightforward Czech Republic win in that one. Um, the Czechs until the fourth quarter, I thought looked really good against Turkey last night. Um, you know, they move the ball really well. They play advantage basketball well, and they, uh, they had some uncharacteristic turnovers that, that let Turkey uh, kind of pull away toward the end there. So I, I would expect Canada to be opposite the, the Czech Republic on Saturday. And that's a tough one. They've got Jan Vesely. They, they've got a seven footer. Uh, they've got Thomas Shodoransky who, uh, you know, could really move the ball. And the big challenge for that one, if that's who Canada plays, is that they're going to they're going to have some size disadvantages and the way the Czech offense works and their philosophy at that end is they'd love for you to send two guys into the post and double or, or zone up because they do move the ball and hunt advantages pretty well and that's something again for three quarters I thought they did well enough against Turkey there wasn't a lot of shot making in, in that game that that game was much more a FIBA game than the two Canada games so far in terms of final score and flow. Uh, but yeah, um, you know, I, I'm, if it's Uruguay, um, they're not as uh, established. They, they looked fun and feisty against Turkey in the, the first couple quarters of that one. But uh, yeah, I'd expect it's the, it's the checks on Saturday. Okay, so, you know, like I mentioned, Canada has to do it. And so far, they have been doing it. We know we're getting performances. Andrew Wiggins, 20 points last game. And, uh, you know, Andrew Nicholson comes out of no, or out of nowhere with 14 points off the bench there for Canada. What do you like about what Nick Nurse is doing with the squad in, in such a limited time? Yeah, I think, you know, the the change in styles over those two games and even over the course of each game kind of plays into what Nick Nurse is about, right? He likes yeah. positional versatility. He likes stylistic versatility. And that's something that's a strength of this roster. And, you know, Nicholson's an interesting one because he didn't, he wasn't super effective in the opener. Uh, and, you know, maybe you thought coming in when we saw the preliminary lists that, Nicholson's a guy, hey, maybe he's like the 12th man. Maybe he's a stretch five specialist. And now suddenly, you know, Ken Burch and Kelly Olenek are, are free agents. Tristan Thompson has a player option. So your front court's thinned out a lot. 
And now Nicholson's, you know, pretty firmly in the eight man rotation and you need him for second unit offense. Nurses staggered um, RJ Barrett and Andrew Wiggins so that one of them is on the court all the time. And, and Nikhil Alexander Walker is a nice offensive spark off the bench, but they're going to need some scoring inside um, in those second units. And Nicholson's the guy so far. Um, so I think they'll continue to lean on him. I, I think the way it looks right now is Nurse has eight that he's comfortable with no matter what, and Nicholson's in that mix. And then, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12 could be more uh, matchup and flow based. So I want to talk a little bit more about Nick Nurse. Obviously, everybody knows about his time with the Toronto Raptors, winning a national championship, the Larry O'Brien trophy. But going back in, in his past career, he's done a lot of work overseas with the Great Britain team as well. Um, how important do you think some of his international experiences is helping the team rubbing off on the team in these types of tournaments. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the hope, right? That's why you, you peg a guy like that to, to be in this situation. And that's why great Britain did. And you know why the Raptors did. So I think, you know, it, it's, it's funny when, uh, when the Raptors were on their championship run, you know, that this story came out that Nick nurse was leaning on his G league experience. And at one point Kawhi was like, basically like stop talking about the G League. like <laughs> we're in the NBA finals here um but I think that a way that it's helpful is you know not only is Nurse already familiar with the FIBA game and some of the ebbs and flows but he can lean on that experience right and you know you have um Aaron Dornicamp on that roster and a couple other guys who have played big minutes in international play um you know Nicholson has 30 plus caps Corey Joseph has 30 plus caps um, I think Dorning Camp's got like 60 or something like that. Um, so you have guys who have been through it a little bit, but to have a coach who's also been through it and can kind of, you know, he's not, he's not speaking without experience when he tells them in a huddle, like, Hey, I've been here before. This is what you expect with FIBA. Or like, Hey, here's what we need to do to, to adjust to the physicality or whatever. So I think, I think having an NBA head coach who has a lot of FIBA experience is a great fit for a FIBA team that has a lot of NBA players, eight NBA players on this roster. Um, because I think, you know, a lot of fans, a lot of NBA fans, at least when they look at the rosters of these teams, you know, some of it is the NBA is more familiar than maybe the top Euro league. So, so some of the names you don't recognize, but I think some people tend to be like, Oh, well they have the second most NBA players. Why aren't they the second best country? And part of that is that, there's an adjustment. It's a different game. And that's more than just the three point line and the above the rim rules. Um, there's a lot of, of changes that go into that. So having a head coach who can kind of steward those guys through that change, I think is very valuable. Um, we'll see. It's uh, everything looks glowing right now, but this tournament has no room for error. So, so we'll see. Yeah, no, there, there are two, two games remaining and two wins that need to be had here. And then Canada kind of gets a break with this international tournament being held in Victoria because, you know, like you mentioned, FIBA is a different animal. Um, I cover soccer, the Vancouver Whitecaps predominantly. And um, hearing some of the stories about the players going away for, you know, international duty and, and the things they have to endure, it's the same for Canada basketball when they have to travel. And so it's just nice that they were able to, uh, to get it on uh, a home soil this year. Yeah. What a Sorry, go ahead. Oh, just to say, yeah. I mean, I mean it's, uh, it's unfortunate that, for the semis and the finals, they can only have 10% capacity, yeah. but 10% is better than zero. And hopefully there's some noise there. Cause the gyms have sounded like it's so, it's so weird when the gyms have no noise at all. So I, I, so I've had, I've been able to cover the white caps uh, was lucky enough to cover that in the pandemic in an empty stadium. And that's weird in a big hollow BC place. And with the echoes of a basketball stadium, I can only imagine just like it, just squeaks and because you can pick up everything like the amount of times people are like oh wow they they swear a lot in hockey well they swear in, in pretty much every other sport too you just don't yeah, get to pick it up you know in the uh in the timeouts for greece dropping <laughs> a couple f-bombs there i i uh, actually i was gonna ask you about that what did you think of like um the broadcast production and and them just picking up because they picked up a lot of sound from the coaches in in the huddles and referees too like and that's something that i kind of enjoy because it almost gives you another perspective of the game. Yeah, I, I like it. And it's something FIBA's always done a pretty good job of. They, they do let them get pretty close into the timeouts there where, you know, maybe at the NBA level, they're a little a little tighter on it, a little more cautious about it. Um, and, you know, the, the sound getting picked up is one of the things that 
hey, that's one of the small benefits of not having crowds there, right? You don't have in-game entertainment that you gotta that you gotta shout over to pick that stuff up, and um, so that's cool. I, I think the broadcasts in general. Uh, I watched the the opener on CBC with Dan Schulman and Javon Shepard and Megan McPeak and Andy Petrillo, and I thought I thought that package was, was great, and I'm really looking forward to that crew. Um, for the Olympics looking ahead. I watched the second game on DAZN because, I mean, I wanted a feel for what the DAZN broadcast was like anyway. And, um, you know, definitely, definitely different, mm-hmm. um, but also, also good. It, it's, uh, it's also funny to see, like, I'm pretty sure CBC and DAZN are getting the same world feed and don't have like individual replay command over it because, going back and yeah. forth between the two like sometimes they're talking about something and that and then the next replay or clip that comes up is not what they're talking about whereas you know at the nba level that would be seamless right it's like okay matt devlin mentioned lou dort we're going to focus on lou dort heading into the timeout where there's a little disconnect there but it, it's been it's been good and, and the disown um broadcasts for the the other games in the pool have been a lot of fun too so it's nice to Nice to have that. I know people always, oh, why isn't it on one of the major sports networks? Well, the zone bought the rights and they're they're at least making the most of it. I, I like their their presentation and, and the CBC stuff's awesome. Really looking forward to the the women's basketball on CBC and then hopefully yeah. the men's. Um, yeah, and we'll get I think we'll get more Megan McPeak at that point too, which is always a good thing. Yes, I, I really, I've watched both on the uh, the CBC broadcast. I watched the first one, obviously, on the television, um, the second one just on the streams. But uh, yeah, it's been nice to see that the, uh, the the package that they put together for for coverage of it, it's, uh, it's, it's been really good. And I love listening to Dan Schulman, whatever he's calling. He could, like, if I could hire someone to narrate my life, it would be Dan Schulman. He's so good. And like, like, from a professional and talent standpoint, the ability to do baseball and basketball... <sighs> both at a really high level is tough on its own, but to then to be bouncing, like, you know, at one point he was doing the Jays and marquee baseball games and big East basketball. And now he's, he's stepping into Canada basketball as well. And, and the thing that I love most about Dan calling the national team, and it's come through in these two prelim games is it's something he's really, really passionate about. Yes. And I know the, I know he loves baseball too. And, and that comes through with the Jays game, but you know, you can kind of having, without having talked to him about this, like, I think you can feel that this really means a lot to him to be in this position calling the national team. And especially if the men's side makes the Olympics to, to be on the call for that. You, you can, that, I'm glad you said that because you can 100% hear that passion that he announces it with RJ and RJ bear with another three. Like it just, it, you can hear it and it, it's great. And uh, is I don't know if you know is Dan doing the Olympics as well for, yeah. for men and women? Oh yeah, it'll be the uh well I, I don't know the the men and women split, but I know that Dan Javon and Megan are all involved with it. So yes. I don't know. I don't know if they'll mix and match the pairings. There are a couple days where the men and women could both potentially play. So I don't I don't know how that's gonna shake out. Um, but I know like I know Megan will be back here in Toronto for uh for the Olympics to, to call them from here with Dan and Javon. That's fantastic to hear. So I'm joined by Blake Murphy here on the Unnamed Sports Show. Blake, I'm not going to have you on without talking some NBA as well because we're full in on the Eastern Conference Finals and the uh, the Phoenix Suns just punched their ticket to the NBA Finals with a 130-103 victory over the Clippers last night. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And, you know, the foremost thing is I, I think you're really happy for Chris Paul and Monty Williams, two guys who have been waiting for this a long time. You know, for Chris Paul, I think it's his 16th season and his first finals appearance. Uh, Monty Williams, who is like one of the absolute standards as far as good people in basketball go. And I think a lot of, you know, longtime industry people and people around the game uh, were rooting for for Monty. You know, so sometimes with these things, especially if you're on another team, maybe you're not outright rooting for one team over the other, but I think everyone around basketball is always rooting for Monty Williams. So. Um, that's been really cool. Uh, campaign, the campaign resurgence has been amazing, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's a, I don't want to say it's a rare G League miss for me, but um, usually I have a good, a good sense of when a G League guy is going to break out. And, um, you know, with campaign in training camp with the Raptors two years ago, 
he was like kind of a disaster and then went overseas and then only lasted over there a short amount of time for a number of reasons and then went back through the G League to, to get back. So um, he's a guy, you know, that's a, it's a good lesson. Don't, don't tap out on a guy with, with talent too early. No, not everybody's Bruno. <laughs> yeah. Well, Hey, Bruno having big games for, for Brazil. That's true. That's true. Bruno's having, I can't, I shouldn't be slandering Bruno's name. I, come on. He plays basketball his, better than I do. <laughs> his Afro is pristine now too. It's great. He's like seven, four with the Afro now. Oh, I haven't even seen the Afro. Yeah, the, it's uh, not quite Lucas Noguera levels, but it's, it's legit. <laughs> Okay, well, you know, like we we had some good things in the game yesterday for the Suns, and we had a ridiculous thing with Patrick Beverly deciding to go kamikaze on Chris Paul walking away. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. I don't think I've ever seen something of that nature. Like, you know, you you see the maybe the punches or the shots, but like that was him walking away and and a push to the back like that. Yeah, it was childish is what it was. And that's a good way you know, to describe it. Be- Beverly plays a style that is always right on the edge of what's legal and what's not. But I think, you know, what's hidden within that is Beverly's whole thing is being an agitator, right? And he's yeah. trying to push other guys to that breaking point. And I think, you know, that's a moment where that's the other side of that coin, right? If it doesn't work and you can't rattle these guys, and you're losing and your season's slipping away, you know, that frustration sets in. Now, I think I have some other issues with Patrick Beverly. Um, <laughs> like, I, I do not think he's as good a defender as the reputation suggests. I, I go back to that Russell Westbrook quote about, like, I'm paraphrasing, but it was something like Patrick Beverly has you all fooled. He's just running around doing a lot. He's not actually playing defense. This, um, that, the perfect example I can think of was when you're at work and you were say you work in an office setting or, or some kind of retail setting. The, if you just walk fast and look angry, people think you're really busy and doing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> And that's, yeah, exactly. I guess that's the and, Patrick Beverly of the uh, yeah. NBA. But then also occasionally you're shoving customers, I guess. So <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought, I thought that was pretty, that was pretty Bush league. And again, I'm not, I don't mind the agitator role. I think, I think there's probably a line at, you know, you have to be this good to uh, <laughs> play that agitator role and it not be kind of comical and I think Beverly has slipped below that line of uh, maybe you should just 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 quiet down and just, play some defense. Yeah, man. just just chill it out, Patrick Beverly. I think I yeah. saw something to the last game out. He was dancing over somebody falling down. I don't know if it was Chris Paul too, yeah. but yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to you have to do good. Like uh, you, you can't be playoff Paul when you're not winning in the playoffs. Yeah, and although. Paul George had a he tremendous did, yeah. playoff run, especially when Kawhi went down. I, I know, I know he gets joked about a lot on basketball Twitter and the jokes are funny, but he was, uh, you know, he, he can't do it without Kawhi obviously, but what team that is built around Kawhi could do it without yeah. Kawhi. So I think uh, Paul George was really impressive in that series. I've always liked Paul George. I just think, yeah, he's, he's that second piece and he needs to realize he's that second piece. Cause he always seems to want to be that first piece, but you can't perform on a first piece level. You, you're not allowed yeah, to be a first and, piece. And like he almost, he pretty much did in that series. Like, like if that version of Paul George played a full season, yeah. you know, that's a borderline MVP, MVP candidate yeah. guy. Especially like, like how many number one guys defend like Paul George defends over the course of an entire game. It's the list is short. Um, but yeah, I mean, th- the whole reason that Paul George is there is that Kawhi was like, that's my number two. That's the guy who could be my co-star. And I think for Paul George, that's the ideal spot for him. And I think for Kawhi, it's a good compliment. And, and you know, this, uh, it's not as if a team built around Paul George lost here, right? It's a, it's a team built around Kawhi and Paul George that lost Kawhi and lost Zubats and, um, you know, the, the injury losses is uh, another story of the, the playoffs too, but. Yeah. And um, I, you know, I will want to touch on the Eastern conference series because that has been plagued by injuries now too. You know, Trey young missed the, the, the last game, Giannis Antetokounmpo went out. Luckily it's only a knee ex- a hyperextension and not something because it looked really bad 
But um, what do you make of all the, the injuries that we're seeing in the NBA? Yeah, I think um, I'm going to try to – don't mind me for a second. I want to bring up a, a graphic that I made. Uh, well, I say oh, graphic. You, it was you can, very you, basic. You can send it to me, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have my producer put it up right above us while we're talking. Yeah. Uh, okay, so it's uh, – what it is is, is I, I went and I looked at the number of season days in each season versus the off-season days between the seasons. Okay. Um, so usually the NBA offseason is about 110 days long. And last year, the turnaround between um, the end of the bubble relaunch and the start of this season was only 61 days. Now, you can factor in a little bit of like, oh, well, the pandemic was happened and the league was shut down. But I don't think that players could really approach that with the same type of off-season mentality and they normally do one because like nope. they didn't have access to facilities and, and medical staffs and stuff like that and two we didn't know when they were going to come back playing so you, it's you not can as use if, that you can use that example across all of the sports landscapes so yeah. I think that's 100 fair to say like what it, these guys are riding stationary bikes in their house like yeah. that's not the same thing so yeah right nope. so we so we went from having 100 to 110 day off season sometimes even 112 days was the longest one in the last 10 years uh, down to 61. So not quite cut in half, but very, very short. And the thing that really worries me looking forward is that the off season ahead, if the NBA finals go seven games is only 74 days. So we're once again, looking at a, you know, you're getting three quarters of an off season and there's a little bit more certainty, you know, the teams that are off know when they're coming back and, and stuff like that. But you can also add in Olympic qualifiers and the Olympics and summer league will be back this year. And um, so I don't know that the issue is going to get any better in the short term, especially, you know, if the league's trying to start on time, as all the reports have said they are, and they're trying to fit 82 in again, which again, all reports are that they are, you know, typically it's 82 over 177 days and then the playoffs and, that's uh that's a lot coming off of two back to back shortened off seasons. So I would be uh I would be worried about um how this is all gonna look again this time next year. And in the time between, you know, get ready for even more of the load management discussion. It, it's something that I brought up on my show before, just the fact that yes, like we're we're into two compound seasons, and because of that, we're going to get a third compound season. They use the, the, you know, the factor with, with covering the Whitecaps and soccer. And then of course the NHL season, which is compressed and there they'll be starting again, you know, we're in the NHL uh, Stanley cup playoffs. And then the season is set to start again in like two and a half, three months. So, uh, you know, that's, that's big and that's important. And then what frustrates me is the league trying to crack down on, Oh, well, this person's resting. We're going to find like, we're, come on. Like, yeah, I, I think, you know, it's a, it's a weird one because like OKC can can get away with shutting everyone down, and you know they didn't get anything other. Than, you know, they got some bad lottery karma. That's about yeah, it. Yeah, but I think that Sam Presti is allowed to trade first round picks for rest time now, just because yeah. he has so many. Um. <laughs> yeah, and like you know, the Raptors didn't get fined for resting guys. They got fined for misreporting the injury status of guys, which is you know, nitpick, it was probably a slap on the wrist of like, Hey, you guys are pushing this to the extreme. Um, but yeah, the league's going to have to loosen up on it. And whether you call it rest or load management or, or whatever, um, or whether you force teams to be like, Hey, you know, OG hurt his calf last year. So we're going to call this, you know, calf injury maintenance or whatever in the future. You know, I, I definitely think sports science staffs are, are earning their keep. And for the Raptors <laughs> to have a guy like Alex Pekechny, uh, I think you kind of hope that's a competitive advantage. And hey, if you're the Raptors, I think you're also hoping that the rest you gave guys like Van Vliet and OG Ananobi and even Kyle Lowry, if he's back uh, down the stretch this season, effectively extends that, uh, that off season they're working with, right? Absolutely. And since you mentioned the Raptors, that's the last topic that I want to touch on because Blake, uh, you know, you've given me so much of your time already, but it, it wouldn't be uh, a Canadian sports show without talking about the Raptors a little bit. Hearing some interesting rumors flying out with uh, regards to trades, maybe for Pascal Siakam, to the Golden State Warriors for the seventh pick and James Wiseman. Um, what are you hearing? What do you make of that trade? Because I'm not doing it. 
I make that John Hollinger is trolling me personally. And <laughs> it's funny. I sent him, I sent him a message. Yes. Uh, I sent him a message, I think yesterday. And I was like, John, you're cause, cause not only did he write it at the athletic, he also talked about it on the dunked on podcast yesterday and the trade scenarios they were kicking around on that podcast got even worse. Uh, so I, I sent him a message. I was like, John, you're killing me, man. He, he responds back with like, PS happy Canada day because he, he like, he dropped the the line that I hate on the Dunked On podcast. The uh, well, Wiggins is Canadian. Oh, it's like okay. Well, so so this is the thing: is first of all, Wiseman and seven for Siakam would have to expand into a bigger deal it would, uh, I, to make salaries work. So you, you got to take Wiggins back, or you have to take a sign and trade a Kelly Oubre back. Um, and in the Wiggins case, that's Wiggins looked a lot better this year, and I think is in a much better place to contribute to a winning team now. But that contract's still a pretty big negative. So, you know, like like to the point where if you were just taking on Wiggins' contract, you would expect an asset back to take that contract on. So if you're talking Siakam for Wiggins and stuff, like you have to pay not just for Siakam, but to unload Wiggins. So um, I think that would have to be something bigger that's like, you know, 714 Wiseman Wiggins, for like Siakam, Boucher, and one of the seconds or something like that, or, or you know, maybe there's a future pick in there, whatever. Um, but seven and Wiseman is not is not getting it done. And the the area that I really the area that makes it tougher to to feel out is that if the Raptors were to do that, say 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 it's Siakam, Boucher for seven, fourteen Wiseman, Wiggins. And, you know, whatever picks make the deal work for both sides from there. So you've loaded up on, you then have three first round picks in this draft. So, so maybe you're either uh, packaging those for, for Cade Cunningham or, uh, you know, or you're just committing to uh, a youth movement. You know, I, I think probably you then, you're then also looking at trading Fred Van Bleet sometime during the life of his deal. Yeah. Um, not because Fred won't be good until he's 30, but because, you're then you're pushing the timeline back to, you know, OG and an OB Malachi Flynn are 23 yeah. Gary Trent jr. Will be 23 next year. Um, and, you know, Boucher is like 28, 29 and then bleed and Siakam are 26, 27. So um, you'd be kind of pushing it back a little bit timeline wise. So uh, if they were to trade Siakam for future value instead of near term value, I'd expect subsequent moves to follow that. Um, I don't think there's a ton to it. I, th- I think, we're going to hear a lot about Golden State shopping Wiseman plus seven plus salary filler for someone who can step in and play with Steph and Clay and Draymond this year because their window's starting to close. Um, but yeah, I think it would be uncharacteristic for Toronto to A, sell a player that they've invested so much in at the kind of bottom of his value. And B, to be the team not getting the best asset in the deal because it's hard to win a trade if you're not getting the best piece back and you're selling low. And and Siakam is the best piece in that trade. And I'm so glad yeah. that you, oh, yeah. you you know you said that, that the, the, the article is just a troll on you because the amount of messages that I got when that, Josh, what is, what is happening? The Raptors shopping Siakam, are they, what is going on here? Can you talk to some people? Can you figure out what the heck is going on? And I was like, okay, I'll do my best. Yeah. Um, you know, luckily I have Blake Murphy on the show this week. So hopefully yeah, I'll, and can, I'll be honest, like this, stuff. this time of year, trying to talk to people with the Raptors, like it's kind of a dark period because the draft <laughs> is this month and they're out at combines and, and pro days and, and scouting international tournaments and stuff like that. And, um, you know, not that like, Hey, we're moving Siakam is something that would get leaked from Toronto <laughs> side anyway, but it's, uh, this is the time of year where you can't, you can't even like bounce ideas off people or talk basketball. So um, anyway, all of that is to say Hollinger definitely heard that golden state would move seven and Wiseman for a big upgrade and Siakam would be a target. And Siakam's uh, on the list. Yep. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I think that definitely is something golden state would do. <laughs> do you, do I, you think what Toronto does in this off season is dependent on what, Toronto does with and Toronto in sports and entertainment does with Masai Ujiri? Um, probably not. Um, I think, you know, anytime you're talking at the executive level or the, pre- the president level, you're talking more of a multi-year 
um, perspective and yeah. a multi-year runway here. And I think, you know, I think if Ujiri went to MLSE and was like, this is my plan for the next three to five years or two years, if he's only signing a, a short-term extension or whatever, um, and they balked at that. Well, I think that would help make <laughs> Ujiri's decision a little easier. I, I think the big thing is that Ujiri has always had basketball autonomy and, and that's going to, that's going to continue if he sticks around. So um, no, I, I don't think, you know, Masai is going to be like, Hey, I'm only sticking around a short term. We got to go all in now. Or, you know, if he leaves Bobby Webster's going to be like, no, I got to tear it all down and put my own fingerprint on it. Like, I think they're gonna they're gonna make what they think are the best basketball moves. They're not a they're not a reactionary front office, really. I would one hundred percent agree with that. And, and and Bobby Webster has learned from Masai Ujiri as long as, as well with the the skills that he's brought to things. So I don't think that if Masai Ujiri doesn't come back next year, things are gonna change too much. And with Masai Ujiri, I, I think and I I've always thought that his plans are bigger than basketball. So when he decides. He wants to to go on and make that move. It it's just going to be a, okay. Have you know go on and make the world a better place in whatever you're doing now, Masai. Yeah, and I think you know the basketball Africa League is something that he's very clearly yes. um, passionate about and, and wants to see succeed. He wrote an op ed for us at the Athletic um, oh, a couple awesome. of weeks ago about that, um, and that's outside the paywall if anyone uh, wants to go check it out. Um, but I think that's something that he's passionate about. Obviously, he's done a ton of. A uh, ton of work with his Giants of Africa charity, um, but yeah, I think that's always been the bigger draw, right? Is like, yeah. is going to work for a more in, like nitpicky and hands-on owner like James Dolan or Ted Leonsis? Like, like is that attractive to a guy coming from a situation where he already makes a lot of money and has basketball autonomy? Like, sure, maybe there's the challenge of of building something again from scratch and some benefits politically and activism wise to being in a, in a New York or a Washington market. Absolutely. Those things exist. Um, but from a pure basketball perspective, it, it's tough for me to see him uh, being in a better situation than Toronto. Yeah, absolutely. Blake, um, it's been fantastic chatting with you about Canada basketball and the NBA. Obviously we ran over the 15 to 20 minutes that I said that oh, I would, uh, but yeah, that normally happens. My, uh, my producer and editor was going to yell at me later anyway, but he was going to do it beforehand regardless um if there's anything that you're working on that you want to talk about or let people know where they can find you on social media or anything like that please go ahead and uh and plug as much things as you'd like right now yeah i mean i'm at blake murphy odc on twitter and all my all my work for the raptors and canada basketball is at uh at the athletic there's always promo codes or deals kicking around so if you don't subscribe yet look for them or just dm me or whatever um, not much more to, uh, to plug than that. It's, uh, it's weird. I used to do freelance full time and I would plug like eight different places and now it's just, <laughs> now it's boring. I'm just at the athletic. So, so no, the athletic. Not, not that the athletic's boring, but these plug, these plug segments are the, the plug, the plug segments can get boring. Yes. But if you don't subscribe to the athletic, like you said, you can probably find yourself a great subscription. I think I got mine for three 99 a month. Um, you can probably find some for like $1 a month. If you, if you scour around all the different athletic writers, you can usually find some good promos. I know Jordan Rodriguez is my go-to athletic writer for the Rams, Tom Strantz, um, for the Vancouver Canucks. So, you know, you guys just cover multiple platforms and, uh, multiple sports. And that's what we're trying to do here at sports Talkland. So until we can surpass the athletic subscribe to them as well. <laughs> Thanks Joshua. I really appreciate it. Awesome, Blake. Well, have a great day. Happy Canada Day and enjoy the uh, Canada basketball this weekend as they look to qualify for Tokyo Olympics. Will do. You too, man. Cheers. All right. So that was a blast talking with Blake Murphy of The Athletic. Of course, we went long as always, but hey, I am editing my own shows right now. So the only person who can get mad at me is myself. Um, no, I guess the I guess Rado can still get mad at me for having an episode longer than 30 minutes. But hey, Rado was um, kind of giving me the, the gears when we were going through a heat wave here. And down in L.A., he was joking around about having to put on a, a sweatshirt and, uh, and two because it was a little bit chilly. So, Rado, you can deal with this episode being a little bit longer. And uh, yeah, so Canada will play the winner of the Czech Republic and Uruguay. And they'll play on Saturday in the semifinals. The finals will be on Sunday. And like you heard in the interview, I might just be slumming down there and hanging out in the parking lot 
trying to uh, to talk to some players and uh, and doing my coverage from down in Victoria. So I hope that everyone enjoyed that interview uh, from the unnamed sports show. I've been your host, Joshua Griffith, here on the Sports Talk Line Network. Remember to tune in every Thursday. There's going to be some bonus episodes coming up here because I have some great guests lined up and I will be recording whenever they have time. So tune in and check back when you can. Uh, Like I said, this has been the Unnamed Sports Show. Remember to love sports, all sports.